Welcome to another week of online uh, Sunday schools. We're walking through the Gospel Project as we're looking at the life of Jesus and really Passion Week where Jesus is leading up to the cross and we're getting very close. We're in these hours uh, after the, we talked about celebrating the Passover last week and then, you know, having that last supper and now that he's left that meal and he's gone out to pray, this, this is a moment for him where really things will pick up pace as we face uh, really a long night. And he begins praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's spending these hours in prayer, and we'll look at that today, and really to see how God has had this plan uh, unfolding the entire time. It's, it's always been there. People may not be able to see it as they're living it out here, uh, in this time, but, but God's had a plan at work leading up to this point with Jesus. And so the whole time from the time he pointed his face towards Jerusalem, now that he's there, now that the week and the, the conflict with the religious leaders is heating up, and now that he's had this last supper and it's time to institute the Lord's Supper, which the church will practice to this day, now, now he's going to go into this time of prayer. And there's been this plan the whole time. And you think about, you may not always be able to see the plan, but it is behind the scenes. A good way to illustrate this might be uh, the idea of painting. Uh, I have a friend who uh, paints pictures, and, he, and sometimes he'll, he'll do them in front of crowds. And, and when, he, when he does these pictures, he gets up in front of a group and will paint them fairly quickly. And, and will do them, they're, they're beautiful pictures. They're, they're amazing how quickly he's able to do them, but well, one of the tricks behind it all is before he actually goes up to paint it, it might be a canvas, he's able to behind the scenes sketch in small ways uh, just kind of the basic proportions of the painting. They're laid out on the uh, canvas uh, before anything's ever done, and there's this master plan given before the painting's ever painted. And in the same way Jesus is operating here, where there is a master plan at work, it, it's already sketched out. It's, it's already been laid out from the Old Testament to today. And, and Jesus is just simply painting it. He's, he's living it out, doing what God has planned from the be very beginning. And, and so we're going to see a couple of themes woven through this text today. Uh, first, the theme of of God's plan from the very beginning, from the scriptures, from the, from the Old Testament. We'll talk some about the fulfillment of, of that here in the text. And so we'll, we'll look at that plan. We'll also uh, see the theme of Jesus being the innocent one that's condemned. And even as this occurs, there are several points the author um, uh, you know, as we're reading here, the author of the gospel will make showing us that Jesus is truly the the one who is innocent, not deserving of this uh, punishment. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Mark chapter 14, and we'll begin reading in verse 32. So if you've got your Bibles there, Mark 14, and the first main point we want to look at today is that Jesus affirms the will of the Father. Jesus affirms the will of the Father. And so he's, he's going to here even in these early moments before the cross, affirm that this is all part of God's plan. And one of the big questions you have here, it, it, Jesus is, we're going to see him dread this, uh, the, what's coming. And we're going to talk about what's coming around the corner, the cup and the wrath of God. But, but I'll just ask you before we read it, why is Jesus so distressed over what's to come? What is it about what's coming around the corner that is so bothersome to him? So let's begin reading Mark 14, verse 32. And they went to the place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And so we're on the Mount of Olives. Anytime you hear the Mount of Olives, that's a whole mountain. Inside of the Mount of Olives is a garden called Gethsemane. So we're there on that same hillside overlooking uh, the where he would teach his disciples, overlooking the Temple Mount. They can see uh, the Temple Mount where the religious leaders are. And so here they are in this uh, garden. And he says, stay here while I go pray. Verse 33. And he took with him Peter, James, and John. And so we, we now see the inner circle, these, these three that he's close to. And he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. So it really bothered him. And so uh, you, you see Jesus who 
you imagine is a very strong man uh, is is really bothered by something. You don't you don't see a description like this anywhere else where he's this upset. Look at verse thirty four, and he said to them, "My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch." He says, "Stay here," and he says, "My I am I am in great distress." It, He's really bothered, and we'll see how this physically happens here. Look at verse 35, and going a little further. So he goes on a little further. It says he fell on the ground. So he literally collapsed. He's walking along, and it's, he says, I'm feeling almost like I'm going to die. I'm under such stress. And even as he's walking, he, he just collapses. He just falls down. He falls to the ground. He just begins to pray, and look what he prays. If it were possible that the hour might pass from him, he expands it here. He said, Abba, Father, this, this Father to him, God the Father, all things are possible for you. He says, remove this cup from me. But then he, then he submits. He says, yet not what I will, but what you will. Let's, let's deal with this in stages. Before we look at the submission to what the Father's plan is. Before we look at that big picture, let's look at the cup. He says, remove this cup from me. I would say that cup is the reason behind his distress. That that defined in the cup is the, 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 the distress that Jesus is facing. And inside of that cup is the wrath of God. It's God's wrath to be placed on him. Now the cup metaphor, this idea of God uh, storing up his wrath is found throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, the prophets, uh, the prophets and the Psalms speak about this. Ezekiel 23.3 speaks of a cup of horror and desolation for Judah. Isaiah 51.17 speaks of the cup of his wrath, the cup of staggering Think about even the picture of Jesus falling down here. This is the wrath of God, the cup of staggering. For Jerusalem, Je Jeremiah uh, 25, 15 speaks of this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand for the nations. And in, and in Psalm 75, 8, it speaks of a cup in the hand of the Lord and that all the wicked of the earth shall drain this cup. So, so this picture of this cup that is God's wrath. The book of Romans says that as we sin, we're storing up wrath. So every time you commit a sin, every time a wrong is done, every, every time uh, something against the holiness of God happens, there is another drop in this cup of wrath of, God, of the, the wrath of God. And even as you go to the end of you, you hear echoes of this in Revelation as you hear about the bowls that contain the wrath of God that are, that are poured out. So you, you have this idea of the wrath of God being stored up in a cup. And this, this wrath is, is the reason that Jesus is so distressed. It's, I know it's easy to get wrapped up. Uh, you know, years ago when The Passion of the Christ came out and you could watch the movie and you could see this violent physical suffering that made the movie rated R and had this intense picture of the suffering of Christ. And so you could sit there and think, well, Jesus suffered like that because of that wrath that was coming. But that, there are plenty of people that are Christian martyrs in history that, like Stephen in the Bible, that faced their martyrdom with very little fear. The same thing about Jesus here. It's not, it's not the cross or the nails or the or the crown of thorns, or the mocking, or the shame. That's not the big deal here. The big deal is this cup. The wrath of God to be poured out on him. So, so let, let that remind you today of a couple of things. If the wrath of God is being stored up, one of the great encouragements we have is that in our sin, God does not directly pour his wrath out on it. So, so that means by His grace, He is not immediately punishing us. So I am so thankful that every time I sin, God's wrath doesn't immediately pour out on me. Because straight out of the garden, we would have been instantly done for. 
So because of God's grace, he is withholding and restraining his wrath. But the danger of that becomes is we begin to minimize God's wrath. We begin to think it's actually not there. It doesn't actually exist behind it all. There's actually no penalty for it. It's as if you were to walk into a store and have into your mind, you were to think, you know what, I can take whatever I want. You walk around the store picking up every item you want, you pile up your cart, you fill bags and all kinds of stuff, and you think this is great, and then you go to walk out the door, the security guard walks over and says, no, 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 what you've done here has a moment of payment. Go, go over to the cash register. That's the sense here of our lives is it's easy to begin to think all this stuff is free, 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 free because God's grace has been extended to us. But there is coming a day when that bowl, that cup, that wrath of God is going to be poured out on someone. And without Christ, his wrath is poured out on you. The other encouragement I would say you can draw from this is with this cup, this wrath of God, it, you can know that true justice does exist. It's easy to begin to think if somebody does something wrong to you, that, that there's no justice in this world. Nobody's, gonna, nobody's ever going to fix all these wrongs. But you have to know that if, if God is storing up this wrath, somebody will pay for the wrongs. So for everybody who's not in Christ, they're going to pay for everything that they've ever done. And for those in Christ, Christ will pay for all of those sins they've ever done. But, but justice, the scales of justice that feel tilted in this world, they'll one day be completely balanced, either by the blood of those who don't know Christ or the blood of Christ who pay for the sins of those he has redeemed. So that's ultimately what we face in front of us is knowing that justice does exists and that Jesus truly does love us. If this wrath of God is that terrible, that much more is the love of God for you and me. Understanding the depths of this cup also helps us understand the depths of what Jesus did for us, how much he actually loves us and we're a part of this divine plan to save us. So Jesus upholds here what has been always planned is this wrath of God to be poured out on him. But, but as he proceeds, more things happen to fulfill the scripture. So here's your second point. Jesus affirms, Jesus affirms the plan that was foretold in scripture. So he's going to affirm that this was all part of what God had planned and it was said in the scripture beforehand. He had to be part of his plan if he was going to write it down and then accomplish it. So let's look at what he says here in verse 43. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came. He was one of the twelve. Notice Mark makes a point here to say, Judas is one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Chief priests, scribes, elders, crowd, swords, clubs. Think about the scene. There is a posse of people coming to find Jesus and they're not showing up with olive branches and worshiping him like he did when he came into town. This group comes with weapons and they come to arrest Jesus. Now verse 44, uh, Mark, as many of the gospel writers will do, make sure we know who, G who Judas was. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. So seize him and lead him away under guard. When he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. What, a, what an intimate betrayal that Judas did. What a moment to, he didn't just walk over and point. Judas walked up and greeted him and in that moment betrayed Jesus. Verse 46, so they laid hands on him and they seized him. So just imagine this violent kind of crowd, 
you know, the noise that might be and the intensity. And so Jesus, who isn't going to resist, he, he's, they're going to grab a hold of him and pull him away. So they seize him, but one of those who stood by drew his sword. He struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now we know this is Peter. In his intensity, in his moment, he doesn't like that somebody's coming after Jesus. And he cuts off his ear. Now this is one of the distinctions of being a Christian here. That we, we aren't people that defend the honor of Jesus. This is actually a a distinction that might be different than you might see as a, as a Muslim. If you knew somebody who followed Islam, the, the, the job there is to, if somebody dishonors the Prophet Muhammad, you are to, you are to bring, you know, to, to defend his honor. But here, uh, we know that Jesus is the persecuted suffering one. And in this moment, uh, there's not this sense of, hey, I am Jesus, the one you defend. Peter here is, in the wrong. Jesus said to them, uh, have you come out against a robber? So just to pause, you know, he puts the ear back on, he gets, gets on to Peter, says this is not how we're going to act. This is not how we're going to handle God's plan here. Verse 48, Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? So Jesus marks this crowd. So not only have we heard the description that Mark gave, but Jesus will so, you know, what are you doing here? You brought clubs, you brought swords. What are, you, what are you thinking? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching. You didn't seize me. But, he says, let the scriptures be fulfilled. This was part of God's plan from the beginning. And for, for Jesus... He wasn't wrapped up in the little day-to-day -day things. He could see a bigger picture than everybody else. He had a bigger plan than everybody else had. He knew things and saw things nobody else was seeing because there was a bigger plan at work. You know, at my house with my kids, one of the things that if you're a parent and you've got kids and you're they're, they they kind of operate, y'all's world all operates together at the house. You do a lot of the same things together. You're staying at the same home, eating the same meals together. But the experience of a child in a home versus a parent in a home are drastically different. There are things when I grew up in my parents' house that I had no clue were going on. All behind the scenes of the house. Now that I'm a parent, now that I'm the, you know, the adult in the house, there are all kinds of things I know of now that me and my wife deal with just from even a household budget, even things we deal with that in our lives as we, as we go to the places that, you know, we work and serve and the friends that we have and the relationships we have. There's all these bigger picture things going on. And there's a lot of times there's some substantial things happening and my kids have no clue what's going on. I, I like it that way. I want them to grow up in a world where they don't have to bear every burden that mom and dad do. I'm thankful my parents were like that. And so there's a level at which mom and dad know a plan that the kids don't. The same thing's true here of Jesus. When everybody's active and clubs are flying and Peter's chopping off ears and Judas is coming up thinking he's betraying and doing something with Jesus. I mean, everybody thinks they're part of whatever their little plan is, but Jesus knows something bigger than any of the rest of them do. He's able to see a bigger picture and he says, you know what, there's a plan here and it's from the Bible. It, it's all part of a bigger plan that God has for us. And I hope for us, we live with the kind of humility knowing that we don't see God's plan. We don't understand God's plan. And we've, we have to know that there's a bigger picture and a bigger piece of the puzzle that we don't get. And, you know, my daughter asks me every now and then, Dad, why, is, why can life be so hard sometimes? And I think, well, you know, you haven't even faced real hard things yet. But for her, it feels sometimes hard. And it feels like, you know, you start to ask God, why is it that it's like this? Why is it, why is it that it's like this? But the real answer is, I may see my corner, but God sees something much bigger. And here Jesus says, you know what? There's a plan that was happening way bigger than anybody else saw. And it's in the scriptures. It's in the Bible. We'll talk more about that 
in this final point, and the third and last one, is that Jesus affirms his identity as Messiah. He, he's going to come out and say, this is who I am. If you study the Gospels throughout it, he, he starts to hold back. There's times he says, don't go tell anybody. There's times he's willing to let it out and say, that this is who I am. But Jesus is a bit slow about saying it. But as the plan ratchets up, he's letting it fly. And here he is uh, in this kind of final trial as he's going into his crucifixion. And, and he's going he's gonna to say who he is. Look at verse 53 of Mark 14. And they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the priests and the elders and the scribes came together. So they had all this posse come get him. And now everybody's kind of lined up here with Jesus in front of the high priest. The high priest stood up in the midst and they asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? And then in verse 61, he fulfills a scripture that, that you may be familiar with. Look at 61. But he remained silent and he made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? So they're asking him, Are you the Christ? Which, you know, if you recall, Jesus is his given name, Christ is his title. He is the anointed one. He is the chosen one. He is the Messiah. So when he says, are you the Christ? Are you the chosen Messiah? Are you claiming to be the one God has sent to save us? So when he's asking him, are you the Christ? Are you the son of God? So he's, he's asking him these uh, direct questions about it. But in the beginning, it says he remains silent. If that you recall, that's Isaiah 53, verse 7, where, where it says he was oppressed and he was afflicted. So he's being oppressed here. He's afflicted. They're coming after him. You get that picture of it. Uh, but, but yet he opened not his mouth. And then it describes him. He's like a, a lamb that uh, before its slaughter is silent or like a sheep before its shearer is, is silent. So he's not speaking. And it says, so he opened not his mouth. He's not, not giving anything back. He's silent before them. But he does answer, he finally does, in verse 62. Jesus said, I am. Right? That's the phrase we're all familiar with. From the Old Testament, God calling himself the I am. And so now we hit the New Testament, and one of the many I am statements is given right here when they, says, they say, are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God, are you the Son of the Blessed? And he says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Wow, what a statement, right? And the high priest tore his garments. So if you're not sure about what any of those mean, the high priest tells you what the, all that meant. It was so upsetting and such a big deal to him he starts tearing his garments because of the blasphemy that he's hearing. Because he doesn't believe. He believes Jesus is claiming something he should. He said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. So we, we get a clear picture here. When Jesus said it, he said, we don't need anything else. Clearly, he has claimed things that are uh, blasphemous before God. And this is one of the reasons, just to pause here, that we can't say Jesus is just a good person or a good teacher. It's why you've, you've heard the argument, either he's either Lord, he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. Because either he's Lord, and you agree with everything he just said. You know, it's one thing to be able to say, I'm going to be seated at the right hand of God. I'm going to be seated at the right hand of power. Now, what if I started walking around here saying that? I, Mike Powers, is going to be seated at the right hand of God. You'd think, man, that guy's crazy. And you'd feel like I was blasphemous before God. If you think that about me, you say, well, we might say, I hope you'd say, well, Mike, Mike's a pretty good guy. And, well, when he starts saying that stuff, he's crazy. So you can't make Jesus, he's either Lord, he's right about what he says, or he's a liar, he's making up stuff, or he's just crazy. 
He's a lunatic. He just has no idea. He's saying his wild stuff. So this is one of the reasons when, when people say, well, Jesus is just a good teacher. We should follow some things he said. You say, no, no, no. He's an all or nothing guy. And he's saying some dramatic things described here of what he tells the high priest. And we see it just in the reaction of the high priest. And then we'll, we'll conclude with the last phrase of what it says about Jesus. And they all condemned him as deserving death. This is the moment as it begins to lay out where Jesus uh, becomes the substitutionary atonement for our sin. He is stepping into our place. Now, one of the things that the text has given us the whole time is Jesus has said, even when Judas is the one coming to him, Judas isn't the one who's rightly acting and calling him out. He's the betrayer of the one who's righteous. Even when Jesus has the clubs, as they come to him and try to attack him, Jesus says, I don't know why you're doing this, because there's no need for this. Even as he's before the high priest and they're trying to put all these charges against him, there's no, there's no need for it, because he is the innocent one. He does not deserve this treatment. But yet they condemned him to death. Jesus in our place. He is taking the penalty for our sin in our place. So Jesus in my place is what happens in this text right here. And so we have the picture of the gospel in the holy and righteous one condemned for us. That's the, that's the picture of the gospel as he stands with sin placed on us. So let's, let's go back all the way to the beginning the suffering of Christ, how he's going, he's looking for this bowl or this wrath to be poured out upon him. And that's what's happening here when it says he's condemned. Now this judgment is coming and he's about to take on the wrath of God for us. And that's, that's the amazing part of the cross is that Jesus stood in our place taking the wrath of God for us. That's why when you share the gospel, I know there are lots of things Jesus does for us. He gives us purpose in life. There are things where Jesus takes away the pain of our past. There, there are parts where Jesus uh, uh, is able to give us this joyous, abundant life. But at the core, the crux of the work of Christ, what the gospel really is at its heart is there are people that are condemned that now are no longer condemned because Christ was condemned in our place. That's the big transaction here. And so at the heart of what makes us Christians and right with God is this moment of Christ in our place. The one who was righteous was condemned for our sins. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly thought, Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for our sins. And Lord, uh, we thank you for the fact we don't face the wrath of God uh, knowing that we're found in Christ. Help us to be people that are joyous because of the forgiveness we have in you. And Lord, give us faith so that we might trust your plan is at work in our lives, even when we might not see it. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.